In countries like Egypt, we acknowledge that our relationship is anchored in security interests. From peace treaties to Israel to shared efforts against violent extremism. So we have not cut off cooperation with the new government, but we can and will persistently press for reforms that the Egyptian people have demanded. President Obama there spoke about Egypt on Wednesday when he addressed the graduating class at the West Point Military Academy. Welcome back. This week, Egyptians returned to the polls to select a new president. Last July, President Mohamed Morsi was removed from power during a military takeover after widespread street protests. The Muslim Brotherhood, which dominated the first free election, has now been outlawed and branded a terrorist group. We continue our conversation now with Dr. Saha Khamis and Imam Shakir El Said. And uh, Dr. Khamis, I want to go to you and ask you for your comments on what President Obama just said there. Was he, in effect, saying, uh, we don't really care about things like freedom and democracy. You know, you can do whatever you want to as long as you don't threaten us. I think that this is not exactly what he is seeing, saying. He's saying that Egypt is a strategically important country, an important ally of the U.S., and it has always been this way uh, for many, many years. And I think it will continue to be this way because of certain strategic interests, like, for example, the continuation of Egypt to be a stable country in the region, to be an important strategic player, uh, to have uh, its uh, peace treaty with Israel. These are things which are very, very important to the American administration. So I think that uh, he is not saying that, you know, he does not care about democracy or freedom. I think what he is saying is the priorities of the U.S. government and the priorities of the strategic interests of the U.S are the first priority when it comes to relationships with Egypt, which is, of course, something that not very many Egyptians will hail or will not be particularly happy about because they wanted a much stronger and much more firm and clear and decisive position uh, from the U.S. Uh, in support of democracy and freedom of expression and human rights. And they do see that there have been a lot of violations of human rights and a lot of atrocities and a lot of wrongdoings. Uh, that have been taking place uh, since uh, July of 2013, and they're expecting even worse outcomes uh, uh, after this round of elections. So I think it is somewhat disappointing for many Egyptians that these are indeed the priorities of the uh, U.S. administration. They would have liked to see a much stronger uh, position and statement from the U.S. government and from the uh, American, American president in terms of supporting uh, freedom and democracy and human rights in Egypt. How will, the, how will the military interpret this? I mean, they're under no pressure right now because the president has said, look, we will continue supporting you financially. The military hears to Chuck Hagel more than they hear from Obama. Obama violated his own credibility when he spoke in Cairo. It was not Israel. It was not terrorism. It was democracy. But when he came back here and the military did what they did against Morsi, now it is Israel and it is security and it is terrorism. So I believe Obama needs to have some soul searching as to what does he exactly want. Does he want his credibility to be reclaimed back? Who's going to do it for him? When he loses credibility, we, the United States, lose credibility with the Middle East as a whole. Egypt is not a small country, and it cannot be managed by euphemism, double talk, or double standard. You have to talk straight to the Egyptian people. What do you want for the Egyptian people in this partnership? It cannot always be Israel on top of Egypt, terrorism on top of Egypt, and we, the Egyptian people, are living under and second to the American list of priorities, but when they come to Cairo, they want to speak nice. This double talk is understood by the Egyptian people, and they don't like it. How will the election, Imam, be viewed in the region, especially by Israel, Saudi Arabia for one? Uh, Saudi Arabia is a uh, supporter of the military coup, as we know. So they see it as their exit and their protection. They want to be like America. America wants to partner with the military, not with the Egyptian people. So the Gulf countries like Emirates and the Saudi Arabia and some other countries, they are trying to be the Middle Eastern America, whereby they partner with the Egyptian army and they get their things done. So if they are threatened by Iran or any other threat, they want to ship the military back to the Gulf as they did Again, Saddam Hussein, 35,000 Egyptian soldiers were in the front lines against Saddam before American forces came in. So the Egyptian people understand this. The Gulf countries know this. So they are buying the military from America or from the Egyptian people. And they think this is going to continue. The Egyptian people want the Egyptian army to be in their military barracks protecting the Egyptian land, not to be guns for hires. Okay, Dr. Khamis. Uh, 
Is the Imam Shakir making the point here that the United States, as well as other countries in the region, speak to the Egyptian military, not to the Egyptian people? I do agree, unfortunately. You know, we all know that politics at the end of the day, unfortunately, are not always ethical, are not always transparent, are not always fair. When you play politics, uh, you know, as uh, Winston Churchill once puts it, you know, unfortunately, there are no permanent enemies and there are no permanent friends, but there are permanent interests. And that's unfortunately the pragmatic principle that dictates a lot of uh, political interests and choices and decisions that are being made. So I do agree to a large part with what Imam Shaker has stated in terms of the, uh, the uh, strategic interests of many of the countries in the region, uh, some of the Gulf countries like he mentioned, the strategic interests of the U.S. as a country like we mentioned before. Uh, all of these seem to take precedence over the true will and the true choice of the Egyptian people to have a better democracy, to have a better stable country, to have true protection of human rights, to have true freedom of expression. Many, many Egyptians uh, do not feel at all encouraged about this present situation mm -hmm. and unfortunately are not even uh, optimistic about the future at all. Okay, I, go ahead. I beg to, dis do, to disagree with the definition of the strategic interests of the United States as Israel, vis-a-vis -vis Egypt and the Egyptian people. I disagree with the American definition of the strategic interest that creating terrorism to fight terrorism in the Middle East. We've done this before. We've been there for a decade and a half now. And we should know better that our interest as a nation is to partner with the peoples, not with the government. Uh, George Bush uh, Jr. said it very well when he said, for 60 years we have been supporting dictators at the expense of the people. It's time to turn corner. We have to be true to these promises. The Egyptian people, the people in the Middle East, they hear us loud and clear that we don't care about their fate so long as their military is working as our tool. Guns for hire. We used Egypt as a black site for torture, like we used many other nations. The military was a partner in this. Chuck Hagel was talking to Sisi uh, throughout the preparation stages for the military coup and nobody uh, took notice even of what's going on. Okay. The White House National Security Council was fighting with the Defense Department and the State, the State Department to get them on board to work with Obama's policy according to his speech. But I think Brother Obama has lost that credibility since he went and left for Egypt. Okay, Dr. Khamis, I want to raise one final issue with you, and that is when we look at this exercise in Egypt right now, when we look at what is almost the inevitable uh, victory of uh, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. What does this mean in a broader context for democracy in the Middle East, for, for something that became known as the Arab Spring? What does it all mean? Uh, it means a big setback for, for the whole uh, process, because back in 2011, there was a lot of optimism, a lot of enthusiasm about, uh, you know, Egypt not turning back, not going back to square zero, not returning back to uh, the uh, Mubarak era, uh, I think that many Egyptians are very skeptical now that what's going to come next is going to be not the Mubarak era, okay. but even a much worse era in terms of uh, violations of human rights, in terms of lack of freedom of expression, in terms of lack of uh, economic prosperity, in terms of lack of representation and fair play, in terms of all of the uh, you know, above mentioned factors. Okay. So I think that it, it is really seen as a derailing of the whole democratic process and a big setback for democracy in the country. Okay, we are going to have to leave it there. Time has caught up with us. That is it for this edition of The Heat. We'd love to hear from you, so please send us your questions, comments, and story ideas to the heat at cctv-america.com. And now you can listen to CCTV America programs 24-7 from anywhere in the United States by simply calling 231-460-1199. I'm Arnold Nido in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching.